Hello and welcome. Welcome to the Moodle MOOC and today's presentation. My name is Nellie Deutsch and I'm going to uh, be moderating. I'm not uh, Dr. Rachel Sale. Dr. Rachel Sale is going to uh, be appearing in a few uh, minutes. All right, so a little bit of introduction. If you could just add in the chat box where you are from. And I'd like to thank you for joining us. Others will be joining very soon. If you could just write down where you're from, how you're feeling, how you're doing this uh, wonderful, wonderful Sunday. Sunday, whether it's uh, morning, noon, or night, maybe it's Monday already where you are. So that would be exciting too, <laughs> to uh, know where you're coming from and um, if it's still Sunday. So it's sunny, very nice. So we've got uh, South America. Okay, so let me uh, introduce our speaker. Okay, Dr. Uh, Rachel Sale. I uh, had the pleasure of meeting Rachel um two years ago i believe rachel um rachel is a very passionate and caring individual and educator she's had extensive faculty training experience and she does a wonderful job at getting um, teachers instructors in higher education to uh, teach with technology in ways that engage students. She's developed and implemented a university-wide implementation plan for the Quality Matters program. Uh, she also led the design team that developed courses for a new on-BM MBA program. She's an experienced leader. She uh, knows how to design. She knows quite a bit about technology, more than most of us, I would say. And you can read uh, a lot more. I've added this to the courseware on WizIQ so that you can read more about it. She is an experienced user and developer within Blackboard, Angel, Moodle, Canvas, and Desire to Learn. She is a certified Quality Matters face-to-face -face and online facilitator. A little more about our session. It's called Yes! You can make your class interactive. The session will focus on taking a static course with mostly discussions and file uploads to an environment that reaches out to students and asks them to be active learners. Now, that's not an easy task, as most of you know, if uh, you've been a student and if you're a teacher. Uh, the tools are free and they're built into a learning management system. Okay, she's going to go over uh, some of the uh, taking assignments that require students to create a PowerPoint showing the change and so on. And you'll see exactly where we're going. Okay, there's more about discussion questions. The idea is, of course, to engage. Okay, to engage students as much as possible so learning can be meaningful. So I'm going to... Uh, Okay, add the PowerPoint and pass on the mic to Rachel right here. Then I'm going to go into my other computer so I can be Nellie. I don't have to be Rachel. Sorry, Rachel. My, my sister's name is Rachel, as you know. Good to see you. I miss you. You know that. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to mute my mic and let you continue. Take off my webcam. There we go. Oh, you don't see it? It's open. You just uh, need to. Move. Oh, so maybe you don't see it yet. Oh no, uh, that's not the. That's the one. Do you see that? Nope, that's not the one. Uh, it's this one there. Are you able to see that? I guess not. Yeah, it happens. Okay. It's open, but it could be that. Um, <laughs> I don't know. You might need to. Uh, do you have it somewhere else? It's happened before. I've seen. 
Uh, it could be that something is blocking. I see you're uh, in a classroom. Is that correct? Or you're at home? All righty. Um, I've seen this before. Oh, you are at home. I've you know, seen I need where, to click uh, to bring that PowerPoint kind of, down uh, there. Or scary. Will it open you, automatically? Oh, okay. <laughs> where you don't see the PowerPoint. Everybody sees it, but you. All right. So you see it now. Okay. Great. So I'm you my mic. Go ahead. <laughs> Oh, you've got the power. No, can't yeah. bring it open. Well, Nellie really did a pretty good job of talking about me. I just want to talk a little bit about our environment. Uh, I am in the middle of the United States in Missouri, and I teach at the university, uh, Lincoln University, which is what we term a historically black college and university. No, I'm, I'm at home. Right after the Civil War in the 1800s. And we're very proud of our extreme diversity. Oh, there it is. Um, yeah. From all over the world. <laughs> we are an open admissions university, which basically means. Okay, and then do I have the power to change the slides, or are you going to do that? Okay, I just see where to change it. Um, well, Nelly really did a pretty good job of talking about me. I just want to talk a little bit about our environment. Uh, I am in the middle of the United States in Missouri, and I teach at a university, uh, Lincoln University, which is what we term a historically black college and university. Uh, started right after the Civil War in the 1800s here, and we're very proud of our extreme, di extremely diverse. Uh, student and faculty population. We have students from all over the world. Uh, we are an open admissions university, which basically means if you are a high school graduate in the state of Missouri, we welcome you to our doors and take on the challenge of bringing you up to speed and producing you as a college graduate. Uh, that uh, image that I have right there is a picture of our quadrangle, which uh, is uh, his, sim or signifies the historicness of the Civil War soldiers uh, giving all of their money to start this institution uh, back in the 1800s. And uh, can't get the other the other things to go on. Oh, there we go. Uh, I was just uh, showing off my wonderful husband there who inspires me to do things, uh, including starting back from my PhD whenever I was in my late 40s. I said, well, one thing I never did that I thought I would do was get my PhD. And he and my kids said, well, what's stopping you now? So away I went. And very proud to finally be a graduate of Capella University back in 2008 with a degree in instructional design. Before that, I was an art teacher for a lot of years. And I discovered if you're passionate about educating and you're passionate about art, instructional design is the place to be. And. Uh, have a, a rather large family of children. I have six kids and seven grandchildren, and we all stay together using technology as our source. We have uh, Skype birthday parties and uh, uh, hangouts frequently, and so that we are a portion of using what I use in my everyday workshop as a part of our everyday life. Uh, and then our goals for today, I would like to identify a few options for interaction in the online class and explain how these support your overall learning goals for a given unit. And then to uh, encourage you to predict to see how you could use these interaction, interactive options in your class. Because a lot of times I know when we're faced with tough budgets in this day and time, uh, we tend to think, oh, well, I would love to do this or I would love to do that, but we just don't have the budget for it. So sometimes I, I think it's important to think outside the box and be a little creative and stop and think, how can I accomplish this without a great deal of cost to my university and still benefit the students? And, of course, we all know, basically, if you, if you teach online at all, you understand why you need this kind of design. but. We need to create this interactiveness to create community buildings. Uh, the, those are the two really major areas of an online class that take uh, we take for granted in a face-to-face -face class. The kids come in, you smile at them, and you build a rapport with them as the semester goes on. But you face a couple of challenges in your typical online class. First of all, many of them are shorter in nature. So we might have five, six, seven, eight weeks to bond with them instead of the traditional 16 weeks.
And also, they only see you as a name on the paper unless you take steps to change it from that name to a face and a personality. And that we also need to encourage students to engage with each other to create that sense of community. So that's, that's kind of the, what we hope to accomplish today and the why we need to do it. And part of this builds, and this may look kind of funny to you, but I say tradition because those of us that came up in the uh, major areas, the major online universities, it's kind of funny to think of something that relatively new in the history of education as being traditional. But we know from our experiences in the 90s and early 2000s that online education can work, that it can be rigorous, and that you can be challenged, and you can build a sense of community. Uh, for example, Nellie talks about uh, uh, our friendship. We knew each other online and as professional colleagues for about five years before we finally met at a face-to-face -face conference. And um, I, I still rely heavily on um, input from colleagues that I met while I was at Capella. And I know here in the Midwest, a, a lot of people choose to go to Walden University. And I, I interact with those people as they work very effectively in our various uh, state departments that are responsible for developing this. So we know the tradition is there. We know it can work. But now the challenge is to bring it to our own environment. And modern interaction, and this is, it's certainly not unique to Quality Matters, but I think they kind of force you to sit down and think about it. That, uh, <laughs> yeah, Nellie's talking about that. I, I walked into a conference room. I knew she was uh, attending this conference, and I looked across the room, and it, it's just like, you know, that, that person could only be Nellie. So I just walked up and gave her a hug and said, hey, it's, this is Rachel in real life. And the way our friendship continued to grow. Um, but in, in modern interaction, we have the student to content, which is very heavily in traditional online education, and the student to instructor. But we also need to add that student to student. And uh, I think Quality Matters did a, has done a really nice job of identifying that and making it an important part of their rubric that they bring to online course reviews and hybrid course reviews to remind us that each one of these parts is very important. It's a part of the total puzzle that makes the online class and makes it interactive for our students. OK, and this I just want to take a, a second to stop about. But in all honesty, you think about your experience with online education, especially if you've been in it for a number of years. And you think how many times you visit an online class and this is what you see. The instructor says, read my brilliant content paper about this week's topic and post a reply to my discussion questions by Thursday night and reply to two other students by Sunday. And that's pretty much the way all 8, 10, 16 weeks are set up. You download something to read or you're given a textbook assignment and then you have two discussions that basically reinforce how much the instructor knows about this topic. And uh, I will say that uh, probably if you were teaching online in the early 2000s, this was considered a very good design. But we now have so many more options that that's the purpose of my class today really is to just go over some of these options that are available to you regardless of where you're located. As long as you have an internet connection, you can find these things. If you don't have PowerPoint, you can certainly go to Google Docs, or you can go online to skydrive.live.com and access free copies of PowerPoint. So we're no longer bound by just using reading and the discussion board. And that kind of sets you free to teach and also students free to have a, a more exciting time because they fall into this habit. They'll read the book, and they'll write a couple posts, and they'll reply on Sunday because many students are still coming to us basically with that mindset from high school. Just get ready for next week and do what the instructor tells you to do. But it just doesn't have to be like that. It's our responsibility as instructors to break this pattern and re-engage the student. You don't always have access to an instructional design department. 
and you don't always have access to a lot of tools. But you do have the brain that, that you were raised with and educated, and I think uh, that will set you free as long as you start thinking about how to engage the student. Fortunately or unfortunately for us in online education, a motivated student is going to do whatever it takes to get a passing grade. And many of us that were brought up in traditional schools have that mindset. No matter how good or how bad the instructor is, I'm going to get an A because that's what my parents expect. And they don't worry about being bored. If you're fortunate enough to be teaching uh, non-traditional students like nursing education is well known for where they're highly motivated, they work 40 hours a week and go to school traditionally, then you don't have to worry about being interactive because those students are going to do whatever it takes. But the rest of us who are now getting the millennials, if you don't keep them engaged, there's two options. Either they're going to forget to drop your class and they're going to fail because they, they don't attend, or they're going to quit, which also doesn't look too good on your teaching record. So uh, in another way, this is kind of a self-preservation thing. You, know, you are evaluated by your students and by your peers and by your department. And so making a course interactive and engaging is certainly a good way to bolster your teacher evaluations. And so we come down to the aha moment on what we can do and kind of get to the meat of this course. Um, we're going to look at things that are time efficient and you want minimal cost. Easily duplicated is important because if you're teaching five different classes, you want to find tools that you can use in every class or perhaps even copy from class to class. And are also student friendly because uh, you don't want to be ch overly challenged in developing the tool and you also don't want the students to be overly challenged in using the tool. And I've seen a lot of online classes where somebody will think, oh, I'm going to use this because it's really cool. And the, then the students are like, I don't get it. I don't understand how to make it work. They'll try once or twice, and then they just uh, drop away from that assignment. So it's important that it be student-friendly and instructor-friendly. Okay, the number one thing I think you need to start out with is consider giving your students a place to feel free to ask questions or voice concerns without any grade penalty. And this is because they all have questions like did, uh, you know, somebody in, a, in an online or face-to-face -face class might raise their hand and say, oh, well, Dr. Smith, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, uh, I don't get where the assignment is this week. And they don't expect to be made to feel stupid for asking that. It's just a part of the face-to-face -face interaction. But in an online class, if you don't think to give them that open area, they may not be sure if it's okay to ask those type of questions. So if you just go to the, the very top of your course area and put in a discussion question that's not graded, you can call it your virtual coffee shop or um, you know, just a question and answer area if you're a very direct type of person. Um, but you, you can make it, in this case, I have it where you can click on that link but I also embedded a clickable hyperlink inside the picture. So if the students just click on the picture or they click on the questions, uh, I have an embeddable hyperlink here. So no matter where they click, click, it opens up a discussion area. And they can ask questions of each other or ask questions of me. And then I know that I need to clarify something, especially if I see more than one student chiming in on a question like, yeah, I, I don't get it either. Has anybody else got any answers? then that's an immediate message to me that I need to get in there in the middle of the week and clarify something. So that's just a, a very easy, no matter what LMS you're using, but it works really well in Moodle because we have our topic areas to go to. And, okay, and the next thing is to ask your students, how do you feel about the topic? They're used to us coming along and saying, well, I'm the content expert, I'm the instructor, and here's what I want you to learn this week. But if you can get your students to passionately engage with the topic, then they will care more about learning with it. And again, that's just a fact of dealing with millennials. They have to feel there's something in it for them. It, it's no longer just enough to say, well, the doctor says to do this. And so you can ask them that by adding a Moodle poll. 
uh, you decide of your topic. Maybe it has like four or five major areas, and uh, this could be something that's very technical. Like if you're if you're teaching uh, uh, math, you might say, well, which theorem is more applicable to this real life situation? Um, you want to balance your checkbook. Do you need to know how to find a missing element, or do you need to know how to uh, add and subtract? So you, you just, no matter what your topic is, you figure out what could be a question that's related to that and then put a poll in. Again, there's, and I see a mistake I made here, I just duplicated that. It would be choice A, choice B, choice C, choice D, and choice E, but you say there's five components and which is the most important component to you? Again, it's kind of like that question and answer area. There's no right or wrong. It just gives them a chance to say, well, here's what I think. And then you take that and immediately let that, they'll see the results of the poll. Like in this one, this was a, a one that I just pulled offline, but somebody had asked what was the most Im, important part of a, a given website, and everybody took a poll on it. So your new discussion format, instead of saying identify five topics of this week's topic, you say defend your choice. Find experts that agree with you or cite personal experiences that will reinforce the reason you chose this. And that kind of inspires the student to that higher level thinking that we want to see them have. Uh, they learn that, yes, it's okay that they have an opinion, but they also need to find reasons for that opinion more than just personal choice. The only time personal choice is okay is if we're discussing sports teams. Other than that, we need to find experts and personal experiences that back that up. And uh, it's a good idea to always ask them to cite their sources in APA because, again, that just prepares them to move on to a, a higher level of action in the class or APA or MLA or whatever your, your different format is. So you take the poll and tie it to the format. You could also just tie it to a discussion or to an assignment if you wanted to. Like uh, you identified uh, topic A as being the most important, so prepare a PowerPoint that would take this and demonstrate it to a, another class, or that you would use in the work site to format that. Or you know now take your paper and or your choice of topic and expand that to a, a two-page term paper that's, or a two-page paper that's due in at the end of the week. So no matter um, how you use the poll, you can take it to another level and then use it to engage them as writers. And another thing is to use video because webcams, I call them the big equalizer. It's hard to find a computer these days, a tablet, a smartphone that doesn't have at least a very uh, low grade webcam on it. So you use that to let the students engage. Uh, you, can, uh, you can ask them to introduce themselves that way. You can ask them to do discussion forms. Uh, I know, for example, I, I teach a technical writing class and we, as I said, we have some students that come in that are challenged as writers. So I start the semester out by letting them record their discussion areas. And then we go to, all right, you can say one or two main points and then justify the reason with bullet points underneath that. And then I move from those bullet points to developing paragraphs and from paragraphs to papers. And by the end of the semester, everybody's writing it at the level that we want them to be. But we have to kind of scaffold from point A to the end. So the, the use of the webcam lets you do that. In a, in a, with a very simple way and in a way that all students can afford it. I talk about this welcome to my class. This is a thing a lot of our instructors are doing is they will form their own YouTube channel which is a private channel so they don't have to worry. Some of them are a, a little uh, unsure that they want the whole world to see their welcome so they set it for private and it only shows up in their class but they actually go into their content. For example, this is somebody from that uh, teaches a, an extension class through the conservation department. So she went out into the woods where she's comfortable talking about her life and her reason that she's teaching the class and her expectations for it. And as you can see, uh, she taught a class that had eight students and all eight students came on to view that welcome to my class. Yet that's a nice thing that you see the views there because 
that lets you know if, uh, if you're getting the degree of privacy that you want in the class. That's one way to use it. And another way, of course, is the narrated PowerPoint. And in this, um, I use this a lot in my class for very quick and simple ways to take something that I'm not sure that uh, students know how to do something, but I don't want to make a really detailed tutorial that slows the high flyers down. Uh, this is an, uh, was an assignment where I asked them to prepare, prepare a peer review template, but I wanted it as a fillable form in PowerPoint. Or, I'm sorry, not PowerPoint, but in Adobe Acrobat. And a lot of them have never used that before, so I show them where they can go download Adobe Acrobat free trial, and then um, they can click to open that. I don't think this goes, but this will let me bring another item in. I want to share how easy it is to add this YouTube to your format. This is a, an area in our Moodle. And you can go to add an activity or a resource. And in that case, I added that URL, clicked add. And I came here. little description. You can have it show on the main page if you want. And then I just clicked in my YouTube URL. Said yes, that's the one I want to show. Selected that file. And Save and return to the course, and that adds the YouTube to it as a clickable link and opens. Another great way to add YouTube items, and I, I know a lot of people have expressed to me that they're a little hesitant to uh, use YouTube selection on Yahoo, or not Yahoo, but on Moodle because it brings up so many choices. So you notice whenever I went to add that resource, like maybe I want to use a video inside a discussion form. I click to add the discussion form, but I have copied it, my YouTube URL directly. So maybe I want to say like, maybe you're teaching a, uh, history or political science or something, that would be a great prompt for that, where you put in some kind of uh, controversial subject and let the students uh, sure go one way or the other on it. That, that, but you, um, you can choose to add a video there in the I'm Moodle section, but instead of searching videos, you search by your predefined term. Okay. Yeah. And that way it only brings up your one video that you've already selected. In this case, it's going to, again, add my how to take a Word document to an Adobe Acrobat fill a form. But you could use oh, you any could. video that you, you wanted want over your PowerPoint? and insert it into your discussion form. You would need to go to uh, A. And after that's opened text. up. Yeah, I'm sorry, Heather, can you not see that? You can do uh, Nellie, can you maybe do a screen share? Do you see the A for the text? On the left. Oh, okay, it's it's showing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah, I'm going to run real quickly through this again on how to add these videos. I'm sorry. I thought that it was going to appear over my PowerPoint, but. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, 
Okay, yeah, I'm going to run back through real quick how to, uh, let me bring my Moodle back up for some reason it went away. I'm going to sh show you how to uh, easily insert a video. Uh, as I said, uh, the easiest way to add a YouTube video to Moodle is to predefine your link. And in that case, I selected the video that I wanted down here, the HTTP YouTube video. And uh, that way, Moodle doesn't have to search through the, the uh, thousands of video that might be related to your topic. It's going to let you hone right in on the one video. Okay, in this case, here's one that, that uh, let's turn editing on. Okay, and in this case, you could bring it up as a clickable link. And you can also come back, can, you, can everybody still see or did that cut it off again? Nelly? Can everybody still see? I asked if everybody could see. Okay. Okay. So we'll come in. So a clickable link is one way to share, but another way is to embed your video in as a prompt in the discussion, which again allows you to take that discussion form and create a scenario in the student's mind and then ask them to use the higher level thinking. And the way that you do that, you take your form and put a brief, like a, well, we'll just give it a name, but you put in a brief thing of watch this video and defend how you would react. And as I said, this is really great for social science or uh, perhaps your medical fields where uh, you could show a brief some uh, accident reaction or something like that, or you might show a political protest. And then the students can defend with their own personal opinion again, and you ask them to back it up with expert references. But the important thing is to help Moodle out a bit. If you go up here, you can insert Moodle Media. But instead of telling it to search the bazillions of YouTube videos, you do a copy of your specific video that you want them to look at. And that will save you so much time. Otherwise, Moodle will bring up about 10 to 20 videos and say, do you want to look at these? And if they're not the ones that you want, it's very hard to drill further down. So you just do a little bit of research in advance, find the one that you want your students to look at, search only by that one, and select that file. And then it inserts it right into your discussion form. Now let's go back and look at how it's going to open up. And this is what the students see. So whenever they come in, they're like, oh, cool. And they watch the video. Then they reply to this discussion topic with the prompts that you put in there. So again, it's, it's a very easily searchable and easy way to engage the students in a discussion. It's a little bit different than you writing two or three paragraphs of text and then saying how to respond. Okay, now I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint real quick. Okay, as I mentioned, that's a great way, inserting the video like that is a good way to put in a tutorial for your students on how to do the assignment that will save them coming to you or emailing you and saying, I don't get how to do it. You don't have to show them step by step, but you can make a very quick PowerPoint on how to do something or screen sharing record, pop it into YouTube, and then you can use it over and over from semester to semester and from even class to class. If you have several different sections of the same class, you can come back and just tie it to that one YouTube video. 
Another great way is to ask the students to upload a similar detailed uh, event to their own YouTubes. Kids love to put stuff in, on YouTube. They're, they're going to record their friends being silly and pop it up on YouTube or put it in Facebook. And so you're allowing them to take a skill that they most of them probably already know how to do and take that skill and put it into their educational practice. So you can allow them to record their project or to display teamwork. Like maybe each member of a team would um, put in two parts, two slides in a PowerPoint, and then the team leader uploads the whole PowerPoint into video. Another great thing is to have them record their observations. Um, maybe you're doing a class, a biology class, and you're talking about uh, water conservation safety or something like that. Have them go out and find some. Okay. I'm sorry. At the end, Marina, I'll go back through that how to add the video and uh, go over it a little slower. No problem. Um, you can have them upload uh, observations, or you can have them upload a portfolio of their work. And anything basically with your millennial students, if it's got my in it, they're going to fall in love with this type of project. If it's uh, personal work that they do and they can put it on YouTube, you'll find most of them will not only share it in the class, they're going to share it with their friends. A, a secondary benefit of that is it, it starts to tell their friends how cool this online class can be. Now, uh, one thing that I find though, I mentioned using that for teamwork. I want to find that something I, I've kind of found out at the end is uh, of doing several team projects that ended in the video work is to bring them together for collaborative work, whether you're doing a YouTube project or you're just preparing a team project that's presented to a Dropbox, uh, is to engage them first by telling them why we're doing the team project. A lot of students, when they see the word team project in an online environment are immediately going to experience a, a great deal of stress on how am I going to get hold of my team members, how are we going to communicate. So you have to make them understand why we're doing a team project. We're doing a team project because I'm preparing you to work in the business world and in that environment you're going to have to be members of international teams. So I want you to understand how to work in this team project. Or I'm preparing you to be an educator, you're a, a teacher trainee, and I want you to understand how to work collaborative with your peer teachers or to be a good online teacher yourself. So I find it's a great idea to begin anything that is collaborative by explaining what's in it for you to them. Again, that's just part of dealing with a millennial student is to make sure that they understand the benefit in doing the assignment. Okay, and I kind of wanted to go over here, things to add because we are centered on being effective instructors in Moodle and talk about different ways to add, but the best way to think about adding this is to look at your activities and resources and one good thing is to go to add resources. And remember that normally we think of resources as things that students look at. Books, files, folders, labels, pages. But now that you can add these interactive options, you can use uh, a video or a poll or some kind of group work within any one of these also. So it uh, greatly increases the use of resources. But then the other way is to look at adding an activity. Because that's things students do. You can add any number of things here. The choice is your poll, your chats, external tools, feedback. Feedback is another kind of mini poll. And then games. Uh, you notice that one new thing they, that they added with the updated Moodle was to have a book with questions that can be added. So that kind of takes it out of uh, simple gaming theory and more like an interactive lesson. Another good option to use is student journals. 
and reservations for team events, allowing students to print out a simple certificate. So, you know, you did your project and it was performed at a mastery level. So here, print your certificate that you did. You are, uh, did a great amount of uh, work on this team project. Again, it's just another way to engage the students. Doesn't cost you anything and can mean a great deal to them. Then down the road, if you're working with professional development like I do, whenever uh, instructors are done, they want those certificate printouts. That's an easy way to give them something for their promotion and tenure package that they participated in the training. And uh, you don't have to worry about keeping up with it. Just load the certificate into your Moodle course shell. Survey is another format of poll. Turn it in assignments, and that is something that is not free, so all of you won't see that in your um, Moodle area, but if your university or college subscribes to turn it in, that can be added directly through the Add an Activity now. Wikis are great pages for the students. Um, I find with beginning instructors, it's a little confusing for the instructor and it's a little hard for some instructors to turn loose of that power. They don't like students going in and editing what they put up so you you kind of have to take baby steps into that but it's, students are used to the wikis. They've grown up with Wikipedia so they will take to it often uh, quicker than your faculty will. And then workshops are also the way to do peer review. I, I don't know why Moodle calls it a workshop because it's basically a peer review and a self-review area. So that's another thing that you might want to do some checking on before the end. Okay, examples of how I've used wikis with students. Uh, believe it or not, we very effectively integrated it into a Western Civilization class. Uh, the instructor was quite willing to try anything, so instead of the traditional textbooks, he came up with some uh, some interesting reading from the era, like the students had to read uh, Frankenstein, the original version, and then he would start out each week with a topic in the wiki that was pretty much like a discussion prompt, but then the students would come in and edit what he had with their own personal opinion and back it up with... Um, some references underneath there. Your screen is frozen. Is it on add an activity frozen? Because we're just kind of stuck there topic. <laughs> okay. All right. And the important thing that, that I want to remind you is to, like I, I tell my instructors, if you try it and it doesn't work, it's no big deal. Just delete it. We haven't spent a thousand dollars. We haven't spent a thousand hours. Just hit delete and try something else if it doesn't work, you know, and that your students will ultimately be the ones to thank you for this because they're going from that boring area to an area of interactivity. And now um, that's kind of what I had that I wanted to cover today, but since I moved too quick, I'd like to go back through some screen sharing on using videos in there. I'm going to come back to my Moodle area. Hey, I think you need to screen share. You want to go into screen share? Cause okay, you know Nellie, is it showing now? You know, you have, to, yeah, that's it. Now you're going in. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go back into my own personal Moodle area now and kind of go over some some of this on YouTube again. I apologize that I moved too quick. Okay, I'm going to delete this. And this one. Okay, now we're going to... Uh, Okay. Okay. Now everybody can see the Moodle area, right? Okay. 
Now, as, as I was saying, you can use this YouTube option in any one of these areas that you come in. Uh, if you want to use it as a prompt in an assignment, you just have to take this, any area that you would normally have discussion, And if you come down and go to your, a lot of us use this insert image, but you just come right next to it and there's an option for inserting Moodle Media. Now, if you have your own video storage unit on your campus, you can certainly put your videos into your own server area and load from there. It's just a problem a lot of us have is we don't have enough storage area on our campus to, to host multiple videos for each week. So the easy way is to upload your video into YouTube and to create your own channel and make it private so it's only available if you want it to be available. But then you go in and in YouTube, instead of searching through all of YouTube for a subject, Identify your video that you want and cut and paste. Use the share, cut and paste from YouTube, and then you just put that into the search term. And then you, yeah. Okay, what I do with that is I go in by that week's video and I make it to where anybody with the URL can see it for that week that, I, that I'm using it. You know, I mean, it, it doesn't bother me. All my videos are out there for the whole world to see. But again, with if you're working with other instructors, everybody has a different level of confidence with it. So, <clears throat> so in, but like I said, instead of YouTube will search all YouTube videos, like you could go in there and say, okay, search for nursing applications. And it will very robustly show you 10 or 20 different nursing videos. But the problem with that being that it's very difficult to search down through all of YouTube in Moodle. So if you select the video you want before you come to there and just tell it to search by that one item, then it's going to bring up the one file that you want. And you can click to choose that when it comes up. And it will insert the video into any description area that has the WYSIWYG box. So that could go into as an assignment prompt. It can go into a discussion form. It can go into a page. I often will use that in a page of information. Like I'll type maybe two or three paragraphs of my own content. And then I'll say, you know, watch this speech or watch this demonstration from so and so. So you put your content around it. And Take this out. I'm just going to save this and return to the course. And one really great thing that I love about Moodle is it looked like it just went in as a link for you, but after you close it the first time and it comes back, the students see that click here to watch this. And, and again, it's not anything that is more usable, it's just something that's more user friendly. They immediately understand that you want them to watch that video. They don't have to click on a link. You don't have to say a whole bunch of prompt for it. They see it and they immediately get it that that's what you want them to do. And so again, it's all about making things easy for the student and in terms that they understand. Yes, uh, developing the discussion prompts, very much so. I, I often ask students to uh, take charge in discussion questions. And it's like I will have maybe one discussion question that is on something that I want them to, to focus in on. And then I will ask them, you know, I don't use a poll all the time, but I will say, you know, post to this discussion forum with what you think is the important content for the week. And, I find that that's a great way to get them to read the textbooks because a lot of times students don't like to read those textbooks so much. <laughs> and uh, it, they have to go into the textbook to at least identify something for their discussion question. 
And I think, again, that's something that you build over the course of the semester. You start out with something very simple and uh, move on. So by the end of the semester, it's very robust and they feel very confident. But you also have to, I, I think, incorporate the fact that regardless of your age, many online students have that little fear of, am I going to do something wrong? And if I do, it's posted up there for everybody to see. And so you have to encourage them that it's OK. It's like I say, it's OK to fail. And that's not something that students are used to hearing. So you have to be a little, um, I won't say easier in your grading, but you have to grade with more direction in those early weeks to enable them to give them those wings that they're not afraid to fly with by the end of the semester. OK, does anybody else have any other questions about the uh, use of video in there? Or use of YouTube. That works just as well for the students. The only difference is the university has a more upfront cost by hosting that video. I'm just going to go back real quickly and add one. And if you were going to Before you leave use your own video, can you share how the game? And in this work? case, probably you would have to work with your instructional design department, unless you just have huge stories in your own, but you can come in. You can put your video into Google Docs and link from there, or you can go into server files and pull out of there. In this case, if I were on my campus, it, I would go to examples and pull up videos from there. And like I said, that works just as well for the students. The only difference is your university has a more upfront cost by hosting that video. So that's why I, I encourage you to use YouTube, because it's free. So why not take advantage of that? I find that crosswords and Sudoku are great for glossaries. And if you go into your, you start a glossary each semester in there, you can relate to that. Or you can pull questions out of questions, or actually. Interestingly enough, I read the other day that if a student base is under 29 years old, you're not supposed to use crosswords, because I guess evidently that's it's not widely enough used anymore that students understand how to use a crossword. That made me feel extremely old. And uh, you can come in here. Uh, I find that crosswords and Sudoku are great for glossary. And uh, if you go into your, you start a glossary each semester in there, you can relate to that. Or you can pull questions out of questions, or actually ha pull questions out of your quiz base. So that's really handy. And you can make it for grading or non-grading. And, and again, this is very arbitrary. But you just, it's, it's the great thing about any of these games is that they are just like anything else in Moodle. If you go down and pay attention in your options page, in your setup page, it's going to ask you every question you need to know, and the end product is going to be absolutely great. You can say, yeah. Uh, you know, I have used games that I find online and use that as an external yeah. document, as files, but you can't import it into Moodle. You could put a, like a congratulations or try to finish this and maybe an, a prompt for when it's due there. You have your group options and activity completions. They must view it. Mm, you know, I have used games that I find online and use that as external documents in the add files. But you can't import a game into, into the Moodle games area. That has to be, uh, you know, you actually take them out of the Moodle area. But then they can, will come along here. I'm not sure how this is. But it is a good way to 
Okay, now it's not going to show anything because I didn't put a, a vocabulary list in. But if you did, it would it comes up looks just like a traditional uh, game area. One thing students love to I find even older students love this uh, the game of millionaire, which is like the, uh, after the TV show, who wants to be a millionaire? And they uh, they answer the questions and move up and earn money. And then, like I said, the book with questions is really kind of dull, but it is a good way to uh, branch outside the, a typical form. You can have some content, maybe you put in some science slides and then answer the question under that. But the difference is, instead of getting a grade, they get points towards winning the game. So again, it, it's part of that gaming theory that we all read about now that, you know, there's a different reason that students want to do things and perhaps like, you know, we're all concerned with getting badges for, t for completing our things. Completing these games is their version of the badges, so it engages them in a different way. And I kind of look at it that our, our point is not to judge, or, uh, to, but just to take whatever engages them in the topic. Um, you set up the game, and then the students play the game. At this point, unless you link to an external tool up here, whatever your icon is, if you go to an external tool, you might be able to find an, uh, something online that you just take the students out to a more robust game. Again, Moodle is, uh, it's, you have those elements there, and normally with each update, you will find they've added a game or two, but it's all instructor created. So if you want the students to create the game, you take them to an external tool. Now, I have seen this used. Um, recently, I attended a conference where somebody used uh, the game series within a, a class where students were exploring. and challenges as they move through the different areas that you might discover in a philosophy class. So the entire class was moved to game base and then using the games within each area. So instead of having assignments in each topic area, the students had four or five games that they had to create. So I, again, you have to really stop and think there about how you're going to use a game question to get to the higher level thinking. Another thing I want to caution you on is the use of the glossary. And I don't understand why, because the glossary is such a great additional tool, but that does not copy from semester to semester. So if you create a, a glossary to use with your different games or with your assignments, be sure that you create an external copy so you can bring it back in in the next semester. If you, uh, Nellie, one thing I find, if you give students the role of the teacher, if you want them to create a game, uh, it's a good thing to use a non-editing teacher role because then you can select that they have no access to the grade books or other confidential information. So that will yeah, work too if you have students have no and you want them why. to do it. I, mean, I, I did read something about that, but no, it's or, not. I, I find it anyway, I would prefer most of my I not have access to editing the grade book. And then um, the journal activity I don't know, maybe you can get it is a great way slogan. to engage the students with you. We've talked a lot about student and content and student to student, but another way to get them to engage with you is to, to add a journal because uh, it's not. I guess I'm still at 2.4. Did they take it out? Yeah, can you click on stop sharing so we can, ah, that's it. All right. So, yeah, I, I use that in several of our classes with our, um, what we call our GE 101, the introduction to college. So you're telling me now I'm going to have to uh, think outside the box on how to, how to do that next semester, huh? Gave a session the other day on, um, on activities, best practices and challenges uh, with activities on Moodle. Mm. So this was really great because the assignment, Rachel, 
is for this week to come up with um, ideas. Okay, so anything else anybody wants to see or? Exactly what you did. So uh, you did the work. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that, was, that was really nice. Um, so there's a modeling of what, what everyone's expected to do this week. And that is to um, create and document and talk about uh, best practices, but not only uh, and challenges for teachers and for participants. So we've got, um, you know, you spoke about more or less about your perspective, um, Rachel, but what about the perspective of students? You know, what kind of things do they like? Uh, what do they prefer as opposed to what we prefer? Well, you know, um, we have found, especially in our juniors and seniors and our graduate students, <laughs> that at the beginning of a, any semester that has the group projects in it, all we hear is griping, griping, griping. <laughs> and if you really keep them engaged by the end, it, our instructor evaluations are off the chart. They love it. And I think it is, it's just, it goes back to, we always talk about it's a lot harder to teach online than it is yeah. face to face. And because in this, you not only have to plan your whole semester out in advance, but you have to slowly draw them into, this is the right thing for you. And, um, and I, I think that the yeah. students like the group project. Well, you know, um, we have found, especially in our juniors and seniors and our graduate students, that at the beginning of a, any semester that has the group projects in it, all we hear is griping, griping, griping. And if you really keep them engaged by the end, it, the, our instructor evaluations are off the charts. They love it. And I think it is, it's just, it goes back to, we always talk about it's a lot harder to teach online than to teach face to face. And because in this, you not only have to plan your whole semester out in advance, but you have to slowly draw them into, this is the right thing for you. And um, like I said, I, I think that the, the students like the group yeah, projects, and they also are yeah, intensely drawn into video they're, creation. They're, they're, they're they like watching the videos, but they like even more creating a video that is a part of their assignment. And that, that doesn't have to escape the fact that we're teaching them to be scholarly writers, but it can be a way to uh, kind of augment that and make them uh, maybe more global citizens. Because, you know, the days of just being a good writer or so, kind of past, uh, you to, almost uh, have to be willing to incorporate on, that. Uh, to uh, Usually I add it in the chat box, it makes it easier, since uh, those who view the okay, recording uh, also access it. So yes, okay, the badge yeah, code, can uh, we provide that tomorrow? Rachel was modeling exactly what you have to do this week. So um, that's your work. All right, so Rachel, and thank you so much uh, for uh, giving us so much. I learned a lot and I'm looking forward to the game plugin that I'm going to install uh, <laughs> in a couple of uh, hours. Uh, that's really exciting. And uh, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. And I'm looking forward to seeing everybody. Rachel, you're invited to join the uh, Wiz IQ course area and um, answer questions. Okay. And thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I hope you'll be here again for the next uh, MOOC in February. Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you, everyone. This is this was recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube and Vimeo for those who can't get Vim uh, YouTube. <laughs>